Chapter 8. The third period of Bolshevik rule in Ukraine. A. Bolshevik re-examination of the Ukrainian problem. 1. Bolsheviks face to face with the Ukrainian problem. The defeat of General Denikin and the fall of 1919 forced Moscow to face the urgent problem of what Bolshevik policy in Ukraine should be. The issue was the more crucial because the Borodbisti now emerged as a dangerous rival of the CPBU. The experience of 1919 demonstrated to the Bolsheviks the consequences of ignoring Ukrainian aspirations. In their approach to the Ukrainian problem, the Bolsheviks became much more cautious than they had been during the war against the Directory. In early 1920, the Bolsheviks sought earnestly to effect a compromise between the principle of self-determination, a prerequisite for Soviet success in non-Russian territories, and the centralization of power, which alone could ensure the survival of Bolshevik rule. Any infringement of the principle of self-determination tended to lend to the war when waged in non-Russian territory a national character and to turn not only hostile social classes but whole nations against the Bolsheviks, except for small groups of the Russian proletariat and petty bourgeoisie. The continuation of open warfare became difficult both materially and morally, for it exposed the contradiction between the Bolshevik program, self-determination, and Bolshevik practice, red imperialism. The fact that Bolshevik centralism in non-Russian territories inevitably became tinged with Russian nationalism served only to make matters worse. The existence of this dilemma was brought out trenchantly by the old Ukrainian Bolshevik Zatonsky in a speech before the 10th Congress of the Russian Communist Party Bolshevik in March 1921. It is important to distinguish between necessary centralization and primitive Russian jingoism, Russopiatstvo. The term is not mine, but Comrade Lenin's, which he used, unfortunately, only at the end of 1919, for the first time at the party conference. We must accept an intensification of the national struggle. We must expunge from the minds of comrades the, the idea that Soviet Federation means necessarily Russian Federation. It is obvious that for the Bolsheviks, the national problem in Ukraine had become of the utmost importance, first because Ukraine was, after Russia, the largest Soviet Republic, and second, because the Russian chauvinists in, the, in Ukraine were more uncompromising than those, for instance, in Turkestan or the Caucasus. They simply would not accept the idea that Ukraine could be a separate nation. 2. Guiding Hand of Lenin Lenin showed the greatest el elasticity and ingenuity in finding formulas to, to reconcile the contradictory principles of self-determination and centralism. He was the author of all party and government resolutions on national policy in Ukraine at that time. Speaking at the 8th con Conference of the Russian Communist Party Bolshevik on December 3, 3, 1919, Lenin affirmed the indivisibility of Bolshevik power in Ukraine and defined the aim of the party to be an alliance with the, with Ukraine pe with the Ukrainian peasantry and the destruction of the Borodjibist party, just as, just as in the case of the Russian SRs. If some comrades declare that I had recommended a block with the Boroj Biste, they are in error. I hear compare I hear compare the policy which must be applied toward the Boroj Biste with the policy with the policy which which we applied toward the Russian right SRs. In the first week after October the nineteen seventeen coup, at peasant congresses we were then accused among other things of not wanting to use the forces of the peasants after once having seized power. I said then we took over your program as a whole for the purpose of utilizing the peasant forces. We want this, but we do not want an alliance with the SRs. Therefore, Comrade Manuilski is an extraordinary is is as extraordinarily an error as Comrades Yakiv, Drobnis, and Andrei S. Bubnov in alleging that I recommend that I recommended a block with the Borodjbisti. My idea was to point to our need for a block with the peasantry of Ukraine in order to realize this policy we should not conduct the dispute with the Borodjbisti in the way it is being conducted. The question is, do we need a block with the Ukrainian peasantry? Do we need a policy such as we needed at the end of 1917 and for many months in 1918? I maintain that we do. Therefore, the greater part of the state farms must really be parceled out. We must fight against the large farms, we must fight against petty bourgeois prejudices, we must fight against partisan warfare, partisanstvo. The Borodjbisti talk a great deal about the national question, but they do not mention partisanstvo. 
We should demand that the Boroj Bistid dissolve the Union of Teachers, even if it uses the Ukrainian language and the official Ukrainian state seal, in the name of the same principles of proletarian communist policy in the name of which we dissolved our all-Russian teachers' union, since it has not applied the principles of proletarian dictatorship, but has defended the interests and applied the policy of the petty bourgeoisie. Lenin's comparison of the Borodjbisti with the Russian right SRs was inaccurate. The SRs were an anti-Soviet party, while on the contrary, the Borodjbisti defended the Soviet platform. In addition, Lenin's example of the Ukrainian Teachers' Union shows the contradiction into which the Bolsheviks were, were forced in their attempts to solve the national problem in Ukraine. The Teachers' Union in Ukraine, unlike the Teachers' Union in Russia, was no mere trade union, it was an association of those who strove for the national liberation of their country. The dissolved teachers' union in Russia was merely replaced by another Russian organization with a different class composition. However, in Ukraine, the Bolsheviks replaced the dissolved teachers' union with an association of Russian teachers, communist and non-communist, which was interested in the preservation of an indivisible Russia even though red. Equally ambivalent was Lenin's letter to the workers and peasants of Ukraine concerning the victory over Denikin, dated December 28, 1919. It reads in part, Until Ukraine is completely liberated from Denikin, the All-Ukrainian Revolutionary Committee will be its government before the, co the covening of the All-Ukrainian Congress of Soviets. Side by side with the Ukrainian Communist Bolsheviks, Ukrainian Communist Borodjbiste work as members of the government in this revolutionary committee. The Borodjbiste differ from the Bolsheviks chiefly in that they stand for the unconditional independence of Ukraine. The Bolsheviks do not make of this an issue of disagreement and disunity. In this, they do not see any obstacle to, uni to united proletarian work. Let there be unity in the struggle against the capitalist yoke and for the dictatorship of the proletariat over the question of national borders and federal or other ties between states, communists must not disagree. Among the Bolsheviks, there are advocates of complete independence of Ukraine, advocates of a more or less federal tie, and still others in favor of a complete fusion of, of Ukraine with Russia. These questions should not create insurmountable differences. They will be decided by the all-Ukrainian Congress of Soviets. Lenin was here speaking not to the party, but to the Ukrainian masses. It would have been too dangerous to tell them that the Bolsheviks opposed the bloc with the Borodjbiste and in fact favored the dictatorship of the Russian Bolshevik party over the peasants. Hence, Lenin played down the possibility of disagreement, so much so that he recognized as communists those who are in favor of complete fusion of Ukraine with Russia, although in March 1919, at the 8th Congress of the Russian Communist Party Bolshevik, he had branded such communists as chauvinists, who must be fought. In his letter, Lenin referred to such communists in a much milder tone. That is why we great Russian communists must be ready to make concessions in our differences with the Ukrainian communist Bolsheviks and the Borodjbiste when the differences concern the state independence of Ukraine, the form of its union with Russia and the national problem in general. All of, all of us communists, great Russian, Ukrainian or of any other nation must be uncompromising and inflexible in matters concerning the basic prob problems of the proletarian struggle, which are identical for all nations, the problem of proletarian dictatorship, the rejection of conciliation with the bourgeoisie, and the, and the preservation of the unity of those forces which are defending us from Denikin. Lenin's letter purposely avoided all controversial issues, leaving their solution not to the armed insurgent masses, but to narrow party council. Not without reason, Lenin was afraid to admit fully to the Ukrainian masses the differences between the Bolsheviks and the Borodjbiste. The essence of his argument was that one, the Bolsheviks would somehow manage to solve the Ukrainian problem, even though some Bolsheviks were demanding Ukrainian independence while others were advocating, a, were advocating an undivided Russia. Two, the party must form a bloc with the Ukrainian peasantry and isolate the Borodjbiste, absorbing some of the Borodjbiste and, disper and dispersing the rest. And three, Toward this end, the masses must only be told that differences between the Bolsheviks and the Borodjbiste were secondary. In point of fact, the primacy of Bolshevism would be ensured through its administrative and military arm. b. Bolshevik Resolutions 1. The Russian Bolsheviks The first and most fundamental document which reflected the new Bolshevik policy in Ukraine was the resolution of the Central Committee of the Russian Communist Party Bolshevik. 
on Soviet power in Ukraine, later approved by the 8th All-Russian Party Conference, held December 2-4, 1919. 1. Inflexibly applying the principles of the self-determination of nations, the Central Committee deems it necessary to emphasize once again the fact that the CC stands for the recognition of the independence of the Ukrainian SSR. 2. Considering the necessity for a very close union of all Soviet republics in their struggle against the threatening forces of worldwide imperialism, as indisputable to every communist and every conscious worker, the Russian Communist Party takes the position that the de determination of the forms of this union will be decided finally by the Ukrainian workers and toiling peasants themselves. 3. On the basis of the decision of the All-Ukrainian Central Executive of the All-Russian Central Executive Committee of June 1, 1919, and of the Central Executive Committee of Ukraine of May 18, 1919, the relations between the Ukrainian SSR and the RSFSR are defined at the present time as a federative time. 4. In view of the fact that Ukrainian culture, language, schooling, etc. has been suppressed for centuries by Tsarism and the exploiting classes of Russia, the CC and the RCP imposes upon all members of the party the duty of facilitating in every way the removal of all obstacles to the free development of the Ukrainian language and culture. And as much as nationalist tendencies are, obser are observable among the backward section of the Ukrainian masses as a result of the oppression of many centuries, members of the RCP are obligated to treat them with the utmost patience and tact, counteracting these tendencies with a word of comradely explanation of the identity of interests of the toiling masses of Ukraine and Russia. Members of the RCP and the territory of Ukraine must indeed adhere to the right of the toiling masses to study and speak in their native language in all Soviet institutions, and in every way opposing attempts by artificial means to reduce the Ukrainian language to a secondary plane, striving on the contrary to transform the Ukrainian language into a weapon of communist education of the toiling masses. Steps should be taken so that all Soviet institutions have a sufficient number of employees conversant in the Ukrainian language and so that in the future all employees will be able to make themselves understood in Ukrainian. 5. It is essential to guarantee the, clo the closest contact of Soviet institutions with the radical peasant population of the country. To do this, it should be the rule that, in securing a decisive influence over the representatives of the peasant poor, the majority of the representatives of the toiling peasantry be drawn into the revolutionary committees or and Soviets immediately upon their formation. 6. In view of the fact that in Ukraine, to an even larger extent than in Russia, the peasantry makes up the overwhelming mass of the population, the task of the Soviet government in Ukraine is to gain the confidence not only of the peasant but poor, but of the wide strata of the middle peasantry, whose real interests tie them closely to Soviet rule. In particular, in preserving the fundamental principles of our food policy, state gain purchases at fixed prices and compulsory, and compulsory assessment, the implementation of this policy must carefully conform to the conditions of the Ukrainian countryside. The next task of our food policy in Ukraine should be to extract grain surpluses on a rigidly limited scale in an amount necessary to feed the Ukrainian poor peasants, the workers and the Red Army, and extracting surpluses, special attention must be given to the interests of the middle peasantry, rigorously distinguishing them from the kulak elements. Counter-revolutionary demagoguery, which instills in the Ukrainian peasantry the idea that the aim of Soviet Russia is to export grain and other food producer products from Ukraine to Russia, must be unmasked. The enrollment on the broadest scale of the poor and middle peasantry into administrative rule in all spheres should be imposed as a duty of the agents of the central governmental authority, all party workers, instructors, etc. In order to establish genuine rule by the toilers, steps must be taken immediately to prevent the, inund the inundation in Soviet institutions of elements of the Ukrainian urban petty bourgeoisie, which are al al alien to an understanding of the conditions of life of the broad peasant masses in which frequently parade under the banner of communism. The condition under which such elements can be tolerated in both party and Soviet institutions must be, prelimin must be preliminary verification of their efficiency and devotion to the interests of the toilers in action, above all at the front in the rank and file of the army in the field. 
Everywhere and under all conditions, such elements must be placed under rigid class control of the proletariat. In view of the fact that, the, that a large quantity of the arms in the hands of the Ukrainian rural population is, as experience, has shown inevitably concentrated in the hands of the Kulak and counter-revolutionary elements because of the lack of organization of the poor, and that this leads to actual domination of the bandit Kulaks rather than dictatorship of the Tordors, the very first task of Soviet construction in Ukraine is the removal of all arms and their concentration in the hands of the workers and peasants' Red Army. 7. Agrarian policy must be conducted with special attention to the interests of the land economy of the poor and middle peasantry. The goal of agrarian policy in Ukraine should be 1. Complete liquidation of, propri of proprietor land ownership, re-established re by Denikin with the transfer of land to those without land and poor and land. 2. Establishment of state farms only on a strictly necessary scale, conformable to the vital interests of the associated peasants. 3. And the all amalgamation of peasants into communes, artos, etc., rigid application of the party policy, which rejects all compulsion in this, in this respect, leaving amalgamation exclusively to the free decision of the peasants themselves and rigorously guarding against any and all attempts to introduce the principle of compulsion. The tactics behind this resolution, according to Valentin Sadovsky, a once prominent leader of the USDRP, were dictated by the belief that the level of political and national development of the Ukrainian masses was very low. It took into account the fact that the politically immature masses would be attracted by promises of concessions without noticing that these concessions were only temporary and conditional. The resolution silently condemned the Russian Bolshevik policy of 1919 in Ukraine and revised its most important tenets, those dealing with the national, the land and the food problems. A new feature introduced was the bearing of the urban petty bourgeoisie, hostile to the Ukrainian peasantry and Ukrainian national liberation, from work in the new Soviet administration. It was precisely this group which had provided the major support for the Bolshevik occupation of 1919. In Ukraine, the Bolsheviks lacked the support of those classes which were loyal to them in Russia. However, during the Denikin occupation, this group almost in its entirety fled to Russia rather than go underground. The resolution under discussion does denounce them for previous spinelessness and propose that their loyalty to the regime be tested by service in the Red Army. Notwithstanding the intentions of the Bolsheviks to keep bourgeois phil philistinism mesh out of the new Soviet government in Ukraine, the Philistines could not be converted into idealists and nationally tolerant Bolsheviks overnight. They persisted in the Russian jingoist attitude, making enemies of Ukrainian peasants and intellectuals. Once the Borodjbiste had joined the CPBU, they made a determined effort to exterminate such bourgeois philistinism with the party and the administration, but their struggle, led by Blyakidny, ended in failure. 2. The Ukrainian Bolsheviks In line with Russian Bolshevik activity, the CPBU issued a series of official directives and proclamations on national policy in Ukraine. Of these, the appeal to all party organizations of the CPVU issued December 15, 1919, by the Central Committee of the CPVU should be singled out. It admitted that the Red Army's retreat in the face of Denikin's summer advance held to the Ukrainian Bolsheviks' mass immigration to Russia. The atrophy of Bolshevik party life in Ukraine, which had ensued the appeal continued, had been exploited by other parties, in particular the Borodjbiste, to strengthen their influence. This was the more feasible since the Bolsheviks had ha hastened to enroll in the Red Army, while the Borodjbiste, who considered themselves a Soviet party, showed no inclination to help Soviet Russia in its difficult struggle and attempted to exploit Denikin's victory to discredit our Communist Party as a party hostile to the Ukrainian workers and peasants. With the collapse of Denikin, party life must be aroused from its state to lethargy through common effort. Toward this end, in addition to the All-Ukrainian Revolutionary Committee, a small party center was being established consisting of Rakovsky, Zatonsky, and, Kos and Kosyor, members of the Central Committee of the CPVU, and Petrovsky and Manuilsky, co-opted from the All-Ukrainian Revolutionary Committee. Though admitting the flight of Bolshevik party functionaries, Aparatchiki, the, the appeal made a, vir a virtue of desertion calling it aid to Soviet Russia, but in the same breath censored the, the Borodjbiste for carrying on an underground struggle. 
The appeal anticipates that approach to, the, to Ukraine, which later found application in Stalin's policy. The re-establishment of Soviet governmental authority in Ukraine was the subject of the Manifesto to the Workers and Peasants of Ukraine, issued in early December by the All Ukrainian Revolutionary Committee. It was this committee, as Lenin later in the month pointed out, which was to be the government until the, co the convening of the next fourth All Ukrainian Congress of Soviets. The manifesto was signed by the three Ukrainian Bolsheviks members of the committee, G.I. Petrovsky chairman, Zatonsky and Manuilsky. Notable by his absence was Pyatakov, who had been active under similar circumstances in the fall of 1918, Rinko and Yetre uh, Terletsky, who had been a member of the first Ukrainian Soviet government, were later brought into the, com the committee to broaden its base. However, par the parity of one representative each granted the two non-Bolshevik parties did not reflect their respective strength. The Borodbisti were in every way the stronger party, but because the, Bo the Borbisti were virtually a Russian party, they were more palatable and less dangerous to the Bolsheviks. The Ukrainian people, declares the manifesto, becomes a free master of the Ukrainian land. The free and independent Ukrainian Socialist Soviet Republic has arisen again. While the need for the free development of Ukrainian culture was mentioned, primary attention was focused on the unbreakable alliance of, the U of Ukraine and Russia, the pledge of which is the united Russo-Ukrainian Red Army. Another passage straightforwardly states that the Ukrainian Red Army has merged with the Russian Red Army. The unbreakable alliance is referred to as the union of the free Ukrainian peasants with the workers and peasants of Russia. With regard to the land problem, the manifesto declares that in 1919, 10 million disyatins of land belonging to large estates had not been distributed to the peasants because strong Soviet government in the villages had been lacking. The slogan of the day now became Seize the landowner's land. As for the national policy, the aim remained, as in 1919, the establishment of Ukraine in close association with Russia, even though the document ends on the contrasting note of long live the independent Ukrainian Soviet Republic. Sadovsky, uh, Sadovsky's interpretation of the resolution by the Central Committee of the Russian Communist Party, above page 169, applies equally to the All Ukrainian Revolutionary Committee's manifesto. In the manifesto, the calculated attempt to play upon the political ignorance of the masses was concealed even less skillfully. 3. The Borodbist Ukrainian Bolshevik Agreement. Of signal importance was an agreement signed in Moscow December 17 by the central committees of the CPBU and the UCPB. We, the under, we undersigned representatives of the central committee of the CPBU and of the central committee of the UCP Borodbisti, entering into inter-party collaboration in the All-Ukraine Revolutionary Committee, have made the following agreement in the name of our parties. 1. The directives drafted at the conference of the RCP upon the proposal of the delegation of the CPBU are accepted as the basis of collaboration. 2. The Ukrainian Communist Party Borodbisti endorses unconditionally the manifesto of the All Ukraine Revolutionary Committee and together with the representatives of the CPBU and the Revolutionary Committee will carry out the program outlined in the manifesto. 3. Inasmuch as all work of the All Ukrainian Revolutionary Committee is subordinated to the main task of the struggle against the United Forces of Russian and International Counter Revolution, represented at this moment by Denikin, Kolchak, Petlura, and all other enemies of the workers and peasants' government, both sides, both sides signatory to this agreement pledge themselves to support with all their efforts the Russo Ukrainian Red Army in the execution of its tasks of annihilating once for once for all the forces of imperialist world reaction. Therefore, we pledge ourselves to root out all attempts to disperse the forces of the United Revolutionary Front against the White Guard Army, especially condemning all agitation which advocates the organization in Ukrainian territory of separate military formations, or former partisans and disbanded petrorist army men in troop separation of the Ukrainian from the Russian Red Army. We pledge ourselves to fight mercilessly any agitation which disorganizes the Front and Age Counter-Revolution. Signed, K. H. Rakovsky, D. Manuelsky, G. Petrovsky, and S. Kosyor, for the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Ukraine Bolshevik, L. Kovaliv, and H. Hrinko, 
for the Central Committee of the Ukraine Communist Party Borodjeviste, Moscow, December 17, 1919. In the light of the negotiations of for admission of the UCPV to the Communist International conducted in Moscow by Kovalev and Hrinko in the late summer of 1919, it is very difficult to account for the agreement reached with the Bolsheviks. It was in the period December 1919 to January 1920 that the Borodjeviste tried for the last time to create a Red Army of their own, independent of Moscow. It is hardly, it is hardly likely that Hrinko and Kovalev differed from the other members of the Borodjevist Central Committee on this matter. Kovalev, an old member of the Central Committee, refused to go along with the majority of his party in joining the CPVU in 1920. As far as the present offer can recall, Kovalev and Hrinko's mission to Moscow was considered a failure by the rank and file Borodjeviste. Kovalev's open letter to all members of the UCPV, published at the time as a separate pamphlet, offered no solution, rather it was an appeal for, per for perseverance. The latter was the object of irony and criticism among the Borodjeviste leaders. Yet, in spite of altercation between the, Bo the Borodjeviste and the Bolsheviks, the Borodjeviste were not accused of breaking the Moscow Agreement. Only once in a pamphlet published by the political section of the Russian 12th Army did Zatonsky censor the Borodjeviste for inconsistency and for exaggeration of their differences with the Bolsheviks, which he believed was dangerous of, of, uh, to the revolution. One is forced to conclude that the Borodjeviste were consciously playing a double game in the hope that they would eventually gain the upper hand over the Bolsheviks and thereby be able to break the agreement. From previous experience, the Borodjeviste knew that the Bolsheviks were not to be trusted in regard to agreements and treaties. They must also have known of Bolshevik plans to destroy the UCPV. Therefore, they had nothing to lose. In their last desperate mo move from supremacy in, in Soviet Ukraine, the, suc the successful formation of an independent Ukrainian Red Army, they reasoned, might open the doors of the Communist International, at which they now knocked in vain. C. Final Borodjevist attempt to organize the Ukrainian Red Army. What gave substance to the array of anti borodjevist Bolshevik resolutions and proclamations was the final attempt on the party of the Borodjevist to build an independent Ukrainian Red Army. And such an army, as they conceived it, the service of non-Ukrainian nationals would be allowed. They even envi envisaged a joint high command with the Russian Red Army. The Ukrainian Red Army could send its units to aid the Russian Red Army in combating such common enemies as Kolchak in Siberia or Yudenich outside Petrograd. However, it would always retain its Ukrainian character and command and its official language would be Ukrainian. Here was the crux of the Borodjevist demand. Their aim was not, as the Bolsheviks charged, to split the revolutionary forces. They wanted merely an alliance of these forces, which would be separate ethnically and culturally, not fused into a single Russian Red Army. 1. Interlude with Makhno While still underground during the Denikin occupation, the Borodjeviste, represented by Lesovik, Hrudinsky, and Konstantin Matyash, formed a military pact with the anarchist Makhno during a conference with Volin, Makhno's political advisor and Shubenko, Makhno's adjutant. A resolution agreed upon stated it is necessary to combine the parties and units in order to organize an independent insurgent Ukrainian army so as to thwart the party dictatorship of the RCP Bolsheviks. By the time Lenin accused the Borodjeviste of supporting the partisans, the transformation of the Soviet Red Army from a conglomeration of units into a regular army was well advanced. The Borodjeviste, on their part, also realized the importance of a regular army. Seeking the support of parties and units was merely a tactical maneuver. Such units were to provide the, fo the foundation for a regular army. To be sure, Makhno also hoped to profit by the alliance, but as a means to strengthen his own partisan movement. 2. Alliance with Ataman Volokh A much more significant move in the Borodjeviste attempt to form a separate army was their alliance with Ataman Volokh. Volokh, a burly phlegmatic man with a bearded pockmarked face, was a figure out of Repin's painting, the Zaporozhian Cossacks, an officer in the army of the Ukrainian People's Republic. Volokh was nevertheless a sympathizer with the SRs, perhaps even a member of the UPSR. He manifested his leftist views on more than one occasion. In March 1919, he had staged a revolt at the front lines of the Ukrainian People's Republic. 
a revolutionary committee of the southwestern Ukrainian Front consisting of Bolsheviks, Borodbiste, and the representatives of military units was formed in, in Vapny, Vapnyarka, March, tw March 23. The committee accepted a Soviet platform and in, in, consultation, in consultation with the military commanders appointed Volok to replace the supreme commander of the front who had been favorable to the French in Odessa. At the same time, the committee began truce negotiations with Rakovsky's government. A truce was arranged but it was later violated by the Bolsheviks. At the end of 1919, Volokh repeated his performance. Together with two other Atamans, he formed a pro-Soviet triumvirate. The Volin Province Insurgent Committee was transformed into the Volin Regional Revolutionary Council, headed by the local Borojbist Koval. At the head of the Haidamak Brigade, Volokh arrived in Lubar, where Petlura and the government of the Ukrainian People's Republic were established. Volokh's detachment flew a red flag with the inscription Long live Soviet power in Ukraine. A message was sent to Petlura asking that he resign. In reply, Petlura's officer cadets were ordered to disarm Volokh's detachment, but most of them, including some of Petlura's personal guards, went over to Volokh. Early on December 2nd, Volokh's troops seized Petlura's headquarters and the treasury. Petlura, his ministers, army staff, and others, under the protection of the Sichovi Strelci, fled to Nova, Cho Nova Chortoria. The Central Committee of the Borodbis Party, at this time located in Zhitomir, established con contact with Volokh as soon as they learned that Volokh, together with some of the troops, had left the army of, of the Ukrainian People's Republic. It is possible that an understanding between Volokh and the Borodbiste had existed even earlier, yet Tutunik claims that, at first, Volokh had no intention of joining the Red Russians. Having seized actual power, Volokh, so as to give everything an appearance of legality, wanted to compel the government and all who fought for Ukrainian independence to recognize the Soviet form of government. Chuchunik evaluates Volokh's action and Lubar in the following way. 1. Great impudence and carelessness displayed during the, the preparatory period. 2. No specific goal or clear-cut plan. 3. Inability to exploit the revolt. 4. A want of courage to force the entire army to recognize the fact of the coup. and 5. A lack of understanding of when Moscow's policy toward Ukraine. However, Chuchunik is not harsh with Volokh himself. He does not believe that Volokh wanted to destroy the government center of the Ukrainian People's Republic. No one was executed by Volokh, even though it was said that Petlura went in one direction and Volokh in another. Volokh crossed the lines of the Red Army and sent a delegation in search of the Borodbist Central Committee in Zhitomir. When his envoys asked the local committee of the CPVU where the Borodbist could be found, they were told that none were in Zhitomir, although the Borodbis Central Committee was located next door. Volokh's envoys thereupon went to the headquarters of the 12th Red Army in Korosten. Volokh was enraged with his men, reported back the Bolshevik proposal that Volokh lay down his arms within 24 hours. Just then, the Borodbis delegates Shumsky, Nemolovsky, and, Sa and Savitinsky reached Volokh from Zhitomir. The Borodbiste were equally infuriated by the, tackle, the tactless behavior of Volokh and the Revolutionary Council. They criticized Volokh's undiplomatic move in conducting negotiations with the enemy, the Bolsheviks, not from a neutral zone but on the enemy's very doorstep. With Polozis' blessing, a revolutionary committee of right bank Ukraine was formed consisting of three persons Nemolovsky, Wojciechivsky, Vojt, and Savitsky with Volokh as commander-in-chief. At the same time, a revolutionary committee existed in left-bank Ukraine. These revolutionary committees conducted a completely independent policy. The leaders of the Borodbis party Poloz, Shumsky, and Elansky were not members of the committees for fear of spoiling their red careers which they hoped to earn in Moscow should their plans miscarry. If the revolutionary committee succeeded in forming a sizable military force, the Borodbist leaders would proclaim themselves a socialist government of, the, of Ukraine. Without waiting for the Russians to disarm them, Volokh and the newly formed Revolutionary Committee decided to seek a neutral zone. In a declaration to his Red Troops, Volokh stated, We shall drive across the entire Ukraine and unite all active Ukrainian forces. We shall begin to build our own independent socialist Soviet Republic. Mazepa comments as follows. The Borodjbiste started to form their army on the spot without the consent of the Russian Bolsheviks. 
in order to separate itself from the Russian Bolshevik army, which was advancing from the north, the newly formed Revolutionary Committee, together with Volokh and his army, immediately followed in the footsteps of our army of the Ukrainian People's Republic into Kyiv province. Behind the army of the Winter Campaign, Ataman Volokh and his Red Army reached Uman. While still in the Lubar area, he had made contact with the Borojbiste. Now having reached the Uman area, he attempted to win over Cossacks and officers from the Army of the Winter Campaign. However, the results of his action were of no benefit to the Borojbiste. The 6th detachment of the, of the Zaporozhian division, stationed in Uman, was won over to Volokh when the delegation of the Borojbist Revolutionary Committee, headed by Serhii Sav Savitsky, came to that city. On January 10, 1920, Savitsky sent the following communication to Chuchunik. Comrade Yurko, the Revolutionary Committee of Right Bank Ukraine stands on the platform of an independent socialist Soviet Ukraine Republic with its own national Red Army, its own finances, etc. An alliance with Soviet Russia is possible only in combating the enemies of both republics. We are building an army on the spot. The Russians will have to accept the existence of a Ukrainian Red Army as a fact and they will change their hitherto prevailing policy toward Ukraine. However, in order to do this, some sort of agreement must be reached with you. Think it over, Comrade Yurko, and give me your answer. Yours, Sa Savitsky, January 10, 1920. In reply, Chuchunik proposed that Savitsky contact the general staff of the Army of the Ukrainian People's Republic. Savitsky, of course, could not do this. He was prepared to negotiate with Chuchunik, Ataman Khekhorgiv's former chief of staff, but not with Chuchunik's present superiors, the Army General Staff of the Ukraine People's Republic. Chuchunik, who knew Savitsky personally, considered him a great patriot who believed that the success of Ukrainian liberation depended on the outcome of the World Revolution. Chuchunik's account continues. Units of the Russian 44th Division entered Uman January 12, 1920. Misunderstandings between the Russians and the Borodjbisti began to arise immediately. The Red Russians completely ignored the Red Borodjbisti and gradually prepared to liquidate their irregular bands, as they called Volokh's Red Troops. As early as January 14, the head of the Revolutionary Committee of Right Bank Ukraine, Nemolovsky, complained of the ungrateful Russians in a, le in a letter to the editorial office of Vistie Revkom Uma Umaschene, news of the Revolutionary Committee of the Uman Area, number 3, which read as follows. Comrade Editor, number 1 of your bulletin contains an article on the eve of the entry of Red Units into Uman. It is written in such a way as to suggest that the city of Uman was occupied by irregular troops, but regular troops. The Red Army moved in from Christ Christinovka. I request that the next issue of the news correct this and announce that Uman is occupied by regular Ukrainian troops, not by partisans. The official Ukrainian Communist Party, Borodjbisti, is in charge of these troops. I, Nemolovsky, in charge of the political section of Ukrainian Red Troops. This letter was printed, although the direct Uman's Revolutionary Committee, organized by the Russians, had no intention of being subordinate to the Revolutionary Committee of Right Bank Ukraine. It was a moment of crisis between those elements which were on the point of, re of reneging and those which wanted to remain orthodox Borodjbisti with a national coloring. Misunderstandings occurred in all areas of Ukraine. Although in the center of the Borodjbisti were allegedly an official party and the periphery, the Russian elements often paid no attention to the yellow and blue communists, as they called the Borodjbisti. The local population began to place its hopes in the Borodjbisti, in opposition to the Russians. This in turn created difficulties for the local representatives of the Soviet Bolshevik power. Almost simultaneously with the misunderstandings in Uman, the Kanev Revolutionary Committee issued the following order. In view of the dissemination of, provoca of provocative rumors in the city and district of Kanev, we admonish the population of the city and the district that there are no misunderstandings between the two revolutionary parties the Ukraine Communist Party Borodjbisti and the Ukraine Communist Party Bolshevik. These parties are organizing a government of, Soviet, of Soviets of peasants and workers' deputies in Ukraine in complete agreement. Anyone spreading provocative rumors will be remand, remanded before the Military Revolutionary Tribunal. Head of the Kind of District Military Revolutionary Committee, Fedorenko. Chief of the Information and Agitation Section, Krizhanivsky. January 20, 1920, Kanev. 
The Russians spread rumors among the Haidamaki that in Lubar, Volokh took all the gold for himself and the Borodibis Revolutionary Committee, and only silver and copper were left for the Haidamaki. The Bolsheviks were definitely gaining control of the government, Volokh and the Borodibiste resisted but to no avail. In the meantime, the Haidamaki saw that an independent socialist Soviet Ukrainian Republic did not exist. Singly and in groups, the Ukrainian Red Troops started to join our Red of the Ukrainian People's Republic. To join our army of the Ukrainian People's Republic, the entire Red Cavalry under Colonel Legin deserted Volokh and joined the Zaporozhian Division. The Haidamaki became very bitter. They planned to attack Volokh and the Revolutionary Committee of Right Bank Ukraine and then, having repented, come over to our army. Seeing the hopelessness of creating a Ukrainian army, the Borobiste and Volokh decided to dissolve their troops and abandon their plans for the creation of a socialist Ukrainian Republic. Remnants of the Haidamaki were forcibly incorporated into the 44th and, 60, and 60th Russian division, divisions. The Revolutionary Committee of Right Bank Ukraine quietly died. The entire Volokh incident had an adverse effect on the future of the Borodibiste. Some of the party leaders, such as Shumsky, Polos, Elansky, and others, became renegades, while others were forced to go underground. The party of left appeasers died. A few words should be said about the subsequent fate of Volokh. As a member of the UCPV, he too joined the CPVU. However, the Bolsheviks did not use him in his old profession of military leader, but attached him to the propaganda to, to the propaganda train of Petrovsky, the chairman of the Ukrainian Executive Committee. He was executed in the early 1930s during the collectivization drive. 3. The Trotsky Order The Borodbis struggle for an independent Ukrainian army, despite its failure, did leave an imprint on Moscow. A secret order issued by Trotsky concerning Moscow's military policy in Ukraine contains the following relevant points. The task of military organization in Ukraine consists in creating red Ukrainian units out of Ukrainian workers and Ukrainian peasants who do not exploit hired labor with a Ukrainian command and Ukrainian language. A prerequisite is the disarming of the Kulak and completely banded elements of the village and city, irrespective of whether or not they go under the name of Petrists, Mahnuists, or any other name. When the ground has been cleared of banditism, it will be possible immediately to lay the foundation for a Ukrainian workers and peasants Red Army at the outset only if you model regiments strong. All attempts by any political group in, in Ukraine to find support among insurgent units or to make the latter the basis of a separate army must be branded as military sabotage and treason to the sources Ukrainian Republic. The last paragraph was obviously directed against the Borodbis and Mahnuist efforts to organize su just such an army. Chuchunek considers Trotsky's order an attempt to form Janissary regiments in Ukraine. Although he assumes the Borodibiste might have known of Trotsky's plans and hoped perhaps to control in any such regiments. However, no Janissary regiments were created. The only tangible outgrowth of Trotsky's order was the establishment of a Ukrainian military academy for officers in Kharkiv, but it was regarded with, sus with suspicion and dissolved in the early 1930s. Had Ukraine succeeded in creating an army of its own, the reign of terror in the 1930s, when millions of people died of starvation, would have been impossible. d. The growth and dissolution of the UCPV 1. The spread of Borodbism among the masses Some information on Borodbist activity in the post denikin period can be obtained from the work of Ravich Cherkasi. In the last days of December 1919, the Borodbist organs Proletarskaya Pravda, Proletarian Pravda in Russian, in the Kharkiv, Shervoni Stiach, Red Standard in Kyiv, and, and Ukrainsky Proletar, Ukrainian Proletarian, and Yekaterino Stav begin to appear. The first was edited by Kalu, Kalu, Kaluzhny, the second by Hukovich, and the third by Lisovic. Their central organ was Borodba, published in Kyiv. On January 20, they called the Conference of Left Bank Ukraine in Poltava, which was attended by representatives from the provinces of Poltava, Kharkiv, Chernyov, Yekaterinoslav, Kherson, and Tau Taurida. The Borodbiste, competing with the Bolsheviks, now sought the support of the urban proletariat, but they, met, but they met with complete indifference, which they explained as due to the assimilation of the proletariat, Ukrainian by nationality. 
The Bodo Ibisti argue, argued with the Bolsheviks in heated discussion at public meetings and in the press against the policy of the CPB. The representatives of the UCPB in Moscow, the Foreign Bureau, Zabure, Zarubezhnoye Bureau, regarded their chief task as the representation of their party as the center of the World Communist Revolution and the placing of the fundamental problems and next tasks in the development of the revolution in Ukraine on the agenda of the Executive Committee of the Comintern. Hrinko, a member of the Foreign Bureau, emphasized in the press of extremely important facts which the leaders of the proletarian revolution and in particular Comrade Lenin had treated with respect to the issues raised by the Borodjbiste. Lenin severely condemned the Russian jingoistic Rusapetskye work methods of the communists in Ukraine. As far as the present offer recollects, Proletars Proletarskaya Pravda was not a Borodjbist but a Bolshevik newspaper. This the surmise is borne out by the fact that the, pa that the paper continued to appear through the 1930s. It is simply not conceivable that the Bolsheviks would take over a Borodjbis title. When the Bolsheviks created a newspaper for mass consumption in Kharkiv in the 1920s, they did not call it the Robichnaya Gazeta, Workers' Gazette, which had been the name of the USDRP organ, but Robich Robinitsha Gazeta Proletar, Workers' Gazette, Gazette Proletarian. Besides the newspapers mentioned by Ravich Charkasi, the Borodjbisti published Borodjbist in Poltava, edited by Hordi Kotsuba and Mikola Hristovi, and several issues of the dis district paper Kobe Kobeliatsky Borodjbist, Kobeliaki Borodjbist. Krasnoye Znamya, Red Banner, was the only Borodjbist newspaper published in Russian. There is good evidence that the Borodjbist point of view enjoyed some support within the CPBU itself. In February 1920, a group in opposition to the policy of the CPBU published a pamphlet entitled Draft Resolution on Party Policy, in which it pointed to the divergence between party policy and the demands of the revolution. It criticized the leaders of the CPBU for their failure to understand that the social revolution in Ukraine could be brought to a successful end only with the help of the Ukrainian proletariat. After the national oppression of the Ukrainian people under the Romanovs and Habsburgs, the pamphlet declared all attempts to control the destinies of the country from without will inevitably intensify the growth of nationalism. The pamphlet also demanded that the CPBU become an independent member of the Communist International and cease being a branch of the Russian Communist Party Bolshevik. Perhaps the most significant symptom of the spread of Borodjivism was the attitude of the Ukrainian intelligentsia. Having lost all hope of seeing Ukrainian independence achieved through the instrument of the Ukrainian People's Republic, many Ukrainian intellectuals cast their, their lot with the Borodjbisti. This new influence also affected students and other young people. Following the Bolshevik example, the Borodjbisti in early 1920 formed their own youth organization, the Communist Youth Union, Komunistichna Yunatska Spilka. With thousands of members across the country, the union was stronger numerically than the Borodjbist urban organizations. Despite the growth of Borodjbism and its popularity among the masses, the failure to create a Borodjbist controlled Red Army boded ill for the whole movement. The, des the desertion of the old Borodjbist parties and leader Ohi, who broke away from the detachment which he led together with Konstantin Matyash and Lisovic, was a sign of the coming defeat. 2. The Bolshevik ring around the Borodjbisti. The dark outlook for the future undermined the faith of individual Borodjbis leaders, two of them Shumsky and Blyakidne, began to favor amalgamation with the CPBU. The right nationalist wing was against unification with the, UC, with the CPBU, while the revolutionary elements inclined toward merger. The rightist elements, which had played a leading part within the UCPB, remained stubborn. Negotiations with the executive committee of the Comintern over amalgamation were conducted by the right Borodjbis Polos. Two resolutions by the Executive Committee of the Communist International contributed to the further decline in morale among the Borodjbisti. The first resolution, published in, the, in Ukraine by the Central Committee of the CPVU January 13, 1920, read as follows. A session of the Executive Committee of the Communist International devoted to the Ukrainian question was held in Petrograd December 22, 1919. The meeting was attended by representatives of the Central Committees of the CPBU Bolshevik and the Ukraine Communist Party Borodjbisti. After hearing 
and discussing reports by the representatives of these parties, the Executive Committee passed the following resolution. 1. Ukraine was represented at the first Congress of the Communist International solely by the CP Bolshevik, which the Congress recognizes the authorized representative of the Ukrainian proletariat. 2. It became clear from the report of the representatives of the UCPB Borodjbisti that this party, which seeks admission to the Third International, adheres in its activity to the principles of the Third International, and accepts completely the program of the RCP Bolshevik, but because of its recent formation, it does not ha yet have sufficiently strong support among the urban and village proletariat of Ukraine, and has not yet succeeded in making itself sufficiently known or in correctly applying the principles of the Third International. 3. Before replying to the petition of the UCP Borodjbisti, asking for admission to the Communist International, the Executive Committee believes that it has the duty of raising the question of the unification of all communist forces in Ukraine in one party, starting from the principle that in every country there should be a single communist party and bearing in mind that the cause of the communist revolution in Ukraine demands complete unity in the ranks of those who protect the interests of the Ukrainian working class and the peasantry. 4. While considering the conference of December 22nd as the first step toward clarification of the differences of opinion existing between the CPVU Bolshevik and the UCP Borodjbisti, the Executive Committee proposes that the party of the Borodjbisti submit, in addition to its memorandum, the fullest possible reply in a written form to the following questions. A. Its attitude toward the land problem. B. Its attitude toward the national problem, in particular toward national culture and the Ukraine Teachers Union. C its attitude toward the establishment of a common Red Army, in particular toward the problem of the partisan movement, d. its attitude toward the creation of a special economic center, e. its attitude toward Soviet Russia. 5. In order to eliminate the disagreements between both parties and to help them toward amalgamation, the Executive Committee of the Communist International has formed a temporary Ukrainian commission under the Communist International which consists of representatives of both parties, two delegates each. Under the, ch the chairmanship of the chairman of the Communist International, the Commission will deal with controversial issues on request of either of the parties or on decree of the Executive Committee of the Communist International. Chairman of the Executive Committee of the Communist International, G. Zinoviev, Petrograd, January 5, 1920. It was not clear that all Borodbist efforts to gain admission to the Communist International would fail. Final rejection came in the second resolution, published in, in Ukraine on February 29. The Executive Committee of the Communist International has unanimously decided 1. The Executive Committee of the Communist International regrets finding that the party of Borodbiste, which calls itself a Communist Party, in reality departs from the principles of communism in several ex extremely important questions. Two. Agitation in the Borodjbis party's organs is conducted against the Red Army, which helped to liberate Ukraine from the Denikin yoke. Such agitation can not only be labeled contra-revolutionary, since experience has fully shown that the defense against imperialism is impossible without a united, regular, battle-tested Red Army. <coughs> 3. In demanding the immediate formation of a separate national army, the Borodjbisti are forced to seek support among the demoralized nationalist elements of the former Petrovist forces and among Kulak elements in the villages and the urban petty bourgeoisie, democratic intelligentsia. In this way, they actually abandon the merciless struggle against the chauvinist elements of the petty bourgeois groups, a struggle which is blinding on every truly internationalist party. 4. Because of this purely petty bourgeois deviation, the Borodjbiste began to conduct further open agitation against the communists of other nationalities, in particular Russian communists who work in Ukraine. This agitation has nothing in common with the principles of the Communist International and is reminiscent of the darker aspects of activities by the parties of the Second International. 5. The Executive Committee of the Communist International considers that the closest brotherly alliance should exist among those republics in which Soviet rule prevails. The Executive Committee of the Communist International is a cognizant of the fact that the RSFSR and the 7th All-Russian Congress of Soviets, in the resolutions of the All-Russian Central Executive Committee and in other official decisions of the Soviet Republic, recognized unconditionally the independence of Soviet Ukraine and expressed its readiness to join in the closest brotherly association 
of the Ukrainian Soviet Republic. The Central Committee of the Communist International is convinced that, the, that Ukraine can withstand the pressure of the imperialists and their hire, hirelings only by the closest economic and military alliance with Soviet Russia. 6. In view of all this, the Executive Committee of the Communist International is obliged to refuse admission of the party of Borodjbisti into the Communist International. 7. The Executive Committee of the Communist International considers that no one will prevent the true communist elements among the Borodjbisti from joining the ranks of the CPU Bolshevik, the party which fully recognizes the independence of Soviet Ukraine, which has been active in Ukraine for almost 20 years and which has united the most stable elements of the Ukrainian proletariat, and adding a glorious page to the history of the liberation struggle of the world proletariat through its heroic struggle against the imperialist plunderers. 8. The Executive Committee of the Communist International cannot but regard the desire to create a second parallel party in Ukraine as an attempt to split the ranks of the workers. The Communist International demands that in every country there exists only one Communist Party. All honest followers of Communism ought to join the ranks of the solid Ukrainian party, the CPBU. We call upon all workers of Ukraine to do this. Chairman of the Executive Committee of the Communist International, G. Zinoviev. The, since the Borodjbiste held the Communist International in high esteem in their press, the second resolution came as a severe blow. It amounted to a call for dissolution. The second resolution, drafted in all probability by Zinoviev himself, contained severely ina several inaccuracies and falsifications. First, it was not true that the Borodjbiste were ag agitating against the Red Army, they wanted to collaborate with it. But to prevent the Russification of Ukrainian soldiers and a single Russian Red Army, they also wanted a separate Ukrainian army. The fact that the Communist International in this issue sided with the Russian Bolsheviks proves that it was supporting the centralist idea of a single Russian army, in this respect di differing not one iota from the Tsarist army. Second, it was equally false to say that the Borodjbisti agitated against communists to all of other nationalities, in particular Russian communists. In their own ranks, the Borodjbisti had communists of Russian, Jewish and other national origins. The Russian communists were attacked not on the ground that they were Russian, but that they were imperialist. Even sharper were the Borodjbist attacks on such Ukrainian Bolsheviks as Pyatakov, Zatonsky, and Manuilsky. The f third, the, Bor the Borodjbist, just as much as the Communist International, wanted a close brotherly alliance with Soviet Russia, but they meant genuine alliance, not subordination. Finally, the Communist International's resolution was misleading in its claim that Soviet Russia recognized the independence of, of Soviet Ukraine. Had this really been the case, the Borodjbiste would have no differences of opinion with the International. 3. The solution of the UCPB Just how great an authority the Communist International was for the Borodjbiste can be judged from the following exchange of communications which spelled out the formality of dissolution and amalgamation. Comrade Zinoviev received the following telegram March 16, 1920. In the name of the entire party, the old Ukrainian conference of Vorobis communists sends warm greetings to the chairman of the Communist International, Comrade Zinoviev. The conference has voted unanimously to elect Comrade Zinoviev as honorary chairman, the presidium, Blatitny. In the reply, Comrade Zinoviev said the following telegram, Kharkiv, to the old Ukraine conference of Communist Vorobisti. I, heart, I, heart, I heartily thank you for your telegram, and on behalf of the Executive Committee of the Comintern, take this opportunity of saying to you, Communists of all countries who are following the fate of the Ukrainian Revolution would be happy to learn that in Ukraine from today there exists only one Communist Party, which is leading the workers and toiling peasants of, the, of Ukraine to complete victory in close alliance with the Russian Socialist Soviet Federative Republic. The executive, the executive Committee on its own initiative proposes, comrades, that you enter the ranks of the Communist Party of, of Ukraine Bolshevik. The party which for a quarter of a century has paved the way for the present victories. The Communist International is convinced that the unity of all activities of communists in Ukraine is not only imperative but possible. Sinoviev. From the editors. The editors note with satisfaction that the Ukrainian Borodjbiste communists have actually joined the ranks of the Communist Party of Ukraine Bolshevik. Therefore, we now have a single Communist Party in Ukraine. To this party we send our greetings. The UCPB was dissolved by a majority vote at its second Congress in March 1920. A sizable opposition to dissolution led by Polos, 
Lubchenko and Mikhailo Panchenko remained true to the old populist ideals not only, not only on national, but on ideological grounds. As for Shumsky and Blakidny, the most ardent advocates of amalgamation with the CPDU. It was currently rumored among the Borod Biste that they had negotiated with the Bolsheviks prior to the Second Congress unknown to the Central Committee. In the end, however, Levko Kovalev and Mikhailo Panchenko were the only members of the Borod Biste Central Committee who refused to join the Bolsheviks, they remained without party affiliation. No more than the Bolsheviks did the Borod Biste wish a representation of the Muravyov occupation of 1918 or the events of 1919. Patriotism and the desire to avoid the further downfall of Soviet government in Ukraine motivated the Boris decision. They could no longer take up arms openly against the Bolsheviks, nor could they go underground, since this would place them in the same camp of the Ukrainian People's Republic, with which they would not compromise. The one practical means remaining in their view was to resist the CPVU within the existing Soviet framework. For a re reliance on the support they enjoyed among the Ukrainian people. The Boroj Biste held fast to their communist position, di dictated by national as well as by social factors, that a sovereign Ukrainian state was possible only within the communist camp. As a young communist party, the Boroj Biste could not criticize the Bolshevik social program. For that matter, they were not concerned with it. They did not subscribe to the ideal of a separate Ukrainian communist ideology, they went only to secure for Ukraine equal rights with other nations within the framework of international communism. This could be achieved, according to the Borodjvisti, only if the Ukrainian, not the Russian communists, were masters of Ukraine. And concentrating on their, fifth, on their fight for national equality, the Borodjvisti were careful to conform to the Bolshevik social program. They thought that they... The, they thought by, th by this tactic it would be made impossible for the Bolsheviks to accuse them of bourgeois reactionism. Since the Bolsheviks had in principle recognized Ukraine's right to independence, the Borodjbiste attempted to take them at their word. The Bolsheviks, on the other hand, well understood and neutralized the, Bor the Borodjbist sta sta stratagem by playing down by national question the national question and their debates with the Borodjbiste, by emphasizing social problems they brought into question the communist orthodoxy of the Borodjbiste. This was why Lenin, in his remarks on the draft resolution of the Executive Committee of the Comintern, wrote on February 22, 1920, I emphatically insist that the Borodjbiste be accused not of nationalism, but of counter-revolutionary and petty bourgeois mentality. But Lenin's efforts to condemn the Borodjbiste on these grounds failed. In Ukraine, their dissolution and merger with the CPVU were interpreted as the consequence of their nationalism, not their bourgeois outlook. By opposing the Bolshevik solution to the national problem, Borodjbism served as the earliest experiment in this field within the Soviet state system. The experiment ended in failure and tragedy for, ex for its exponents, but it revealed the inability of Bolshevism to solve the national problem. E. Diver, diver views on the, on the dissolution of the Borodjbiste. Ravich Cherkasy, although defending the CPBU, which he had joined in 1919, realized that Bolshevik centralist policy in Ukraine was in need of correction. The following in his account of the dissolution of the UCPB. Finally, in the beginning of March, the executive committee of the Comintern, after lengthy consideration, rejected the Borod Bist petition for admission to the Third International. This decision had a sobering effect on the Borod Bist. They had to place on their agenda the question of the dis discontinuance of the Communist Party, which was declared to be outside the Communist International, the quasi petlerist elements in the C UCPB, in the provinces of Poltava, Yekaterinoslav, Volin, and other areas could not reconcile themselves to this. However, for the UCPB, retreat into the past was cut off with no road ahead. The UCPB had but, no but one way out by shaking off its nationalist elements and by further purifying its Marxist revolutionary consciousness to enter the ranks of the CPVU with unfurled banners. The simultaneous existence of two communist parties, the CPVU and the UCPB, in Ukraine could not but affect the tactics of both. If under the influence of the proletarian revolution in Ukraine and the fierce criticism of the CPVU, the Borodjbiste more and more pulled themselves together and took the road of Marxism, irreconcilable revolution, revolutionism, communism, and internationalism, the CPVU itself was not influenced by the UCPB. 
It was largely due to the influence of the UCPB that the Bolsheviks underwent an evolution from a Russian Communist Party in Ukraine. The proposal of Kvirin's follow followers at the Tag Taganrog Conference to a genuine Communist Party of Ukraine. The federalist tendency within the CPBU was the wedge which the, Bul the Boric Biste drove into the CPBU. Not in vain did Hrinko, in conversation affirming the important role of the Boric Biste in the revolutionary communist movement in Ukraine, refer to the note of the federalists, which clearly formulates the very necessity of, establishment, of establishing not in words, but indeed a Ukrainian so so Soviet Socialist Republic, with a complete apparatus of proletarian power in all branches of life. This was the situation in which both parties, the CPBU and the UCPB, followed the inevitable historical process out of dire necessity, moving closer together while engaging in sharp debate, the one strengthening out its communist line, the other adapting itself to the pe peculiarities and specific conditions of socio-economic and national cultural life in Ukraine. Ravich Cherkasy failed to mention only one thing, namely that a separate CPBU in fact did not exist. It was a Ukrainian branch of the Russian Communist Party Bolshevik, controlled not by the Communist International but by, but by the Central Committee of the RCPB, which later tried and deported the Ravich Cherkasy, which purged and destroyed all the former Boroj Biste and which proclaimed that the CPBU was as, as inseparable from, from the RCPB as was well Ukraine from Russia. A more critical commentary on the Boroj Biste dissolution came from the pen of Hrushevsky in the fall of 1920. Faced with the choice of either merging completely with the Russian communists or becoming an opposition party, the Boroj Biste decided to join the RCP. Such a statement was issued by the representative Shumsky and Elansky in Kharkiv and was later confirmed by a majority vote at the party conference at the end of March of this year. However, this resolution provoked sharp opposition within the party. This opposition, like that of the independent SDs who accepted the Soviet platform and even the name Communist, Ukraine Communist Party, but who did not consider it necessary to merge with the Bolshevik Party, disagreed with Bolshevik centralist policy. In his view, the tendency of the Bolsheviks to uphold at all costs the hegemony of Russian communists in Ukraine and to govern Ukraine without Ukrainians, depriving it of all independence and making it completely dependent on Moscow, is incorrect and harmful. A sharp condemnation of the Borodjbis decision was uttered by the leader of the SR Center, Nikifor Khrikhoryev, who shared with the Borodjbis a common populist heritage, in an open letter to Khristiuk, commenting on his willingness to return to, the so to Soviet Ukraine. Khrikhoryev criticized the policy pursued by Khristiuk and Khrushchevsky for the following reasons. 1. Negotiations with the Moscow Bolsheviks, if not supported by our organized forces, will lead to nothing. 2. The reckless and uncritical search for favors will take us down the road of the Borodjvisti, that is, we will be told if you agree with us, then join us. If you do not want to join us, then you disagree with us. That means that you are our enemies, and enemies we shall fight. 3. To go over to collaboration with the Moscow Bolsheviks without any safeguards for the interests of the Ukrainian working masses means sheer appeasement of the victors, a new Moscophilism, and abandonment of party ideals. The revolutionary position of the Boroj Biste and their emphasis on social principles I regarded and still regard as correct. But their merger with the CPBU and their renunciation of the party program I consider a mistake. Only the exertion of considerable organized pressure could correct this mistake. I shall continue to defend their view, but I do not approve of separate defections, singly or in groups, like the Boroj Biste, and I shall fight them, since I regard them as harmful not only to our party, but to, develop, but to the development of socialism in general. While sharing the Boroj Biste position ideologically, I do not approve of their tactics, which were false and not in the public interest. Having torn themselves away from the masses, they had to merge with the CPBU. The Borodjbiste viewed the situation differently. They did attempt to build a stronger organization, starting from the premise that their own army was a prime consideration. Although they failed, their decision to merge with the CPBU, in the hope of influencing it from within, gained for them a decade of grace to continue to resist centralist Russian policies. Noteworthy, in this connection is Lenin's pronouncement on the Borodjbiste expressed at the 9th Congress of the Russian Communist Party Bolshevik, 
held on March 29 to April 4, 1920. Comrade Bubnov said that the Central Committee was guilty of strengthening the Borodjbiste. This is a most complex this is a most complex and tremendous question, and I think is this most important problem where in intricate maneuvering was needed, we came out the victors. In the Central Committee, we, Lenin, spoke of maximum concessions to the Boroj Bisti. We were laughed at and told that we were not straight in our, in our dealings with them. But one can attack one's adversary directly only when there is a straight line with him. Once the enemy decides to zigzag, we must pursue and catch him at every turn. We promised the Boroj Bisti a maximum of concessions, but one on condition that they pursue a communist policy. In this way we prove that we are not guilty of the slightest intolerance, that our concessions were right was proved by the fact that all the better elements of the Boroj Bisti have now joined our party. We have re-registered that party, instead of a Boroj Bisti uprising which would have been inevitable. We have brought into our party under our control and with our recognition, due to the correct policy of the Central Committee, superbly executed by Comrade Rakovsky, all the best of the Boroj Bisti, while the rest have vanished from the political scene. This victory is worth several good battles. To say, therefore, that the Central Committee was guilty of strengthening the Boroj Bisti is not to understand the political line in the national problem. A reply by Bupunov, who was at that time working in the Ukraine, came in the following form. I ask that the following factual statement be read and appended to the proceedings. Concerning my critical remarks on the policy of the Central Committee toward the Boroj Bisti, Comrade Lenin indicated that my remarks displayed a lack of understanding of the national policy in Ukraine. Comrade Lenin based his argument on facts dating from December 1919 to March 1920. In view of this, I should like to stress the fact that in my criticism, I had in mind a different period that from March to August 1919, the pre denikin period of Soviet rule in Ukraine. I pointed out that at that time there was within, within the Communist Party Bolshevik of Ukraine a strong current in favor of merger with the Boroj Bisti. Although the entire party expressed itself at the First Congress March 1919 against the admission of the Boroj Bisti to Soviet institutions in Ukraine, the Central Committee of the RCPB did not support the trend which favored merger, although at that time this was the only correct solution and notwithstanding the decision of the authoritative representation of, Ukraine, of the Ukraine communist organizations, proposed that the Central Committee of the CPU Bolshevik should bring Boroj Bisti into the Ukrainian Council of People's Commissars, which was of course carried out. I am deeply convinced that by doing this, the Central Committee of the RCPB strengthened the Boroj Bisti and to a certain degree aided the marked growth of Boroj Bisti influence among the masses of the urban proletariat after Denikin's expulsion. I repeat that in my speech I did not refer to the Central Committee's policy toward the Boroj Bisti during the last period, while Comrade Lenin spoke only of this period. Therefore his conclusions are based on an obvious misunderstanding clear to all. The difference between Lenin and the CPBU lay in the fact that the CPBU if not subjected by, to pressure by Moscow, would have been willing to accept the Boroj Bisti in the pre denikin period rather than, than vie with them for influence among the masses, while the Central Committee of the Russian Communist Party Bolshevik, even after the Denikin period, refused them entry in the CPBU, suggesting that they first be tested in the Soviet administrative system. But this Bubnov believed had merely helped to enhance Boroj Bisti's prestige among the masses. It should also be pointed out that Bubnov, in contrast with Ravich Cherkasi, spoke of the growth of Boroj Bisti influence among the urban proletariat after Denikin's downfall. Indeed, this growth caused the greatest alarm among the Bolsheviks. While they could still tolerate Boroj Bisti publications in Ukrainian, the appearance of the Boroj Bisti daily Krasnoye Znamya in Russian infuriated them, since this action indicated that, that the rules of a proletarian of the Ukrainian cities might be prepared to follow the Boroj Bisti rather than the Bolsheviks, thereby seriously endangering their hegemony. The émigré Ukrainian left socialists were correct when they claimed that the entry of the Boroj Bisti in the CPBU was not a consequence of the inner convictions of the Boroj Bisti. After having demanded an independent Ukrainian republic for so long, they could hardly have changed their convictions in a few weeks. External circumstances proved stronger. 
The Borodzh Bisti had no comply with Moscow's demands. If they, if they did not want to be deprived of the opportunity of, carry on, of carrying on the work among the Ukrainian masses, the Ukrainian Communist Party, the former independent social democrats, remained true to its platform, persisting in the creation of a party independent of Russian communists, which would be a section of the Third International and not a branch of the Russian Communist Party. Yet another reason for the dissolution of the UCPB is offered by the Borobis Todos Taran, who joined the CPV. Polish intervention in Ukraine in the spring of 1920, he considered, accounted for the fact that Blakeny, Hrynko, and Shumsky agreed unconditionally to the liquidation of their party and its merger with the CPVU. After it had absorbed the UCPV, the CPVU did not direct its energy toward the consummation of a sovereign Soviet Ukraine a goal which had been proclaimed in the Communist International's reply to the Borodj Biste. The best evidence in support of this view was the continued existence of another Soviet-oriented Ukraine party, the Ukapiste. Demanding a sovereign Soviet Ukraine, the Ukapiste were not forced to join the CPBU until 1925. The struggle for a, Soviet, for a sovereign Ukrainian SSR was decided in the negative not by the internal development of Ukrainian political life, but by the external pressure of administrative organization.